The ninth video in Chapter 4 looks at how you introduce tracking and disturbance rejection into optimal predictive control. So the previous videos have presented the OMPC or SOMPC control law, but look solely at the regulation problem, assumed no uncertainty and no constraints. In practice, of course, we will have uncertainty, we will have non-zero targets. And so this video is going to look at how we modify what we've prevented so far in order to deal with this. The basic approach we're going to take is the same as was given in Chapter 1. That is, we're going to look at the use of unbiased predictions and unbiased costs. The key attribute of the performance index is that it's unbiased. And unbiased means that if we deploy the performance index at the correct steady state, then it will propose that the input remains unchanged. Now, the most obvious terms to use in the performance index J, therefore, are those which are zero at the correct steady state. Now, some com com common components, and hence a generic choice of J, that satisfy this requirement are going to be things like the error being given as the distance between the target and the output, which clearly is zero if the output gets to the target. We have things like deviation variables u, which is the distance of the input from the expected steady state. Or we have rates in u, so the difference between uk and the previous u, which clearly will be zero if you're at the correct steady state. Now, we also deploy a disturbance model. So we assume that the system is subject to some disturbance, which is essentially constant. And therefore, the steady state output is given by the steady state gain of the system times the steady state input plus the steady state disturbance. And this disturbance can sometimes be estimated as the difference between the measurement from the process and a model. The performance index that we're going to use is going to use the errors squared and the deviation variables in the input squared. We're not going to use the rate in the input here, though of course you could. The expected steady state, perhaps sometime in the future, is going to obey the following two equations. So we have that the output is given by Cx plus some disturbance. And the steady state state is given by A times the steady state state plus B times the steady state input. Now, you'll see this is an output disturbance model. Clearly, if you have a different model for your disturbance, then you will get slightly different equations here. And you can go through that algebra yourself. If I solve these two simultaneously like this, then what you'll notice is there's a simple relationship between the steady state output Y the steady state disturbance D and what I expect the steady state states and inputs to be. Obviously, we need an estimate for the disturbance, that's this D term here, in order to do this. And what we're going to do is assume that D is given by the difference between the plant measurement, Yp, and the output from a model, Ym. If I solve these linear simultaneous equations, then I can get an explicit expression for XSS and USS in terms of YSS and D. And typically, what we're going to do, of course, is set YSS equal to R, because we're saying we want the steady state output to be at the target. And therefore, you end up with this equation here. And you're given a reminder, the disturbance estimate must be updated every sample. So what we're going to do now, <coughs> we're going to combine the observations of the previous two slides. So we're going to use a performance index based on the distances between the state and its steady state. So there we are, xk plus 1 minus xss transposed q, xk plus 1 minus xss. And similarly, a component based on the deviation variables in the input. Clearly, this performance index will be zero if you are at the steady state. Now, a simple state feedback, which ensures robust convergence to the correct steady state, will be based on the same deviation variables. So we can write UK minus USS equals minus K times XK minus XSS. And here we've just summarized the other equations that you've got. So how are XSS and USS defined? And how is D defined? So if you take <coughs> these together, 
this will give you a control law which basically contains integral action and gets you to the required steady state. Now, let's take the dual mode predictions based around the implementation of an arbitrary regulator, so that was this suboptimal predictive control law, and now what we're going to do is we're going to introduce the predictive control side, which means we add these perturbations C to the control law. So you'll notice the control law, there's the deviation variable UK minus USS minus K times XK minus XSS, and I've added on this CK term for the first NC step. So that's exactly the same as we've done in the past. The only difference is that this control law is now based on deviation variables rather than absolute. And what we're going to do is optimize predicted performance with respect to the perturbations C and implement the first value. So this is a classic predictive control, but the only difference is we're doing everything in terms of deviation variables. So you see the performance index has got deviation variables in it, and the control law has got deviation variables in it. So let's substitute all this in and see where we get. But what we're going to do is assume that the future disturbance and the target are constant. So we've got our deviation variables, and XSS and USS are not going to change because we've assumed the disturbance and the target are constant. So now I'm going to substitute these deviation variables into the full model dynamics. So there was the model dynamics, XK plus 1 equals AXK plus BUK. And my control law in terms of deviation variables was this control law here. And what I'm going to do is substitute these expressions in. So first, by rewriting it, I can say, well, xk plus 1 can be written as x hat, that's the deviation variable, plus xxs, and uk can be written as u hat, that's the deviation variable, plus uss, and clearly, by definition of the deviation variables, I have this, axss plus buss equals xsss. So if I do this substitution, this is what you find. You find that you get x hat k plus 1 equals a x hat k plus b u hat k. So in terms of the deviation variables, you have the same model, which is quite convenient. And therefore, if I substitute in my original control law, which is this one I've given here, then you find you get x hat k plus 1 equals phi x hat k plus b c k. What have we got then? I can actually rewrite everything in slightly simplified form. You'll notice this is the same as the previous slide, but the difference is I've now written this explicitly as x hat rather than as xk minus xss. I've written this as x hat. I've written I've put hats everywhere, and I've written this as u hat equals minus kx hat, and the control law as u hat minus kx hat plus ck. If I also rewrite j in terms of this x hat, this deviation variable, then what you'll see is these expressions, sorry, not the top one, these expressions down here look exactly the same as the expressions we used in previous videos, with the only difference that we've got a hat. And so therefore, apart from a simple variable change, this is identical in format to the SOMPC algorithm, which we did earlier for regulation. And therefore, any rules which you derive for SOMPC will also apply here, but obviously they will apply to the deviation variables x hat and u hat. And therefore, SOMPC based on deviation variables will share the same properties as SOMPC for the regulation case. So the cost function will be Lyapunov when the target and disturbance are constant. The closed loop will be guaranteed stabilizing, and the deviation variables will tend to zero, and that off obviously implies that you get offset-free tracking. Now, it's implicit in practice that the disturbance estimate, and hence the values for XSS and USS, are updated every sample, because in practice, of course, the disturbance may not be constant, and the target may not be constant. For now, for the examples in this particular video, we're going to assume the disturbance is known, but the later videos will change that assumption. Let's look at some examples then. So video 49, example 1. 
So if we go to MATLAB, and I seem to have got the wrong one, there it is. So you'll see we've got video 49 example 1. And the key thing you want to notice here is this is using this file, chat 4 OMPC simulate B. Now if you just go into that file briefly before we start and see how does it differ from the simulate file we've used before, you'll notice it's got some of these lines here, such as how do I estimate the steady state values XSS and USS, and you'll see it's given the formula it's using here. Basically you find these M1 and M2 matrices, and therefore you'll notice the first lines in the simulation loop are what's the current XSS, what's the current USS, what's the current X hat. Your control law finds C and then finds U hat. And once you found U hat, you can use that to construct the original U. But otherwise, you'll see it's a very simple um, uh, M file, very similar to the one we used in the earlier videos. So let's run this one then. So we'll press F5, and here are some simulations. Now what do you notice? First of all, the red line is the target. So you'll see we start with a zero target and then after about 10 samples the target goes up. We start from a non-zero initial state. So you'll see originally the output is converging to zero because the target zero. Then the target changes and the output does indeed converge to this non-zero target. So we're getting offset free tracking. Then you'll notice after about 30 samples this green line tells you there's been a change in the value of the disturbance. And you'll notice again the algorithm reacts to this. Originally obviously the output changes because of this disturbance but gradually it comes back and you still get offset free tracking as expected. If you look at the cost function you see the cost function is monotonic over the first few samples where we're reacting to the non-zero initial condition. We then get a target change. Now obviously you can't be monotonic during a target change, but once the target change is complete, the cost function is again monotonic. You then get a disturbance change, and once the disturbance change has, has gone, and so the disturbance is now constant again, you see the cost becomes monotonic. So whenever the target and disturbance are constant, the cost is monotonic, which is what we expected for our proof of stability. And because this is OMPC, this example, you'll notice the optimum CK is always zero as expected. So what have we seen? The cost is monotonic while the target and disturbance are constant. The responses are convergent as expected. And the perturbation terms CK are zero. So this is with OMPC. And we also get offset free tracking as expected. Let's look at example two then. So here's example two. So if I run this one, and this is SOMPC. So what do you notice here? Very similar to before. You'll notice when we have the target change here, the output has some non-minimum phase characteristics, but eventually it gives you offset free tracking. We then have a disturbance change, that's this green signal. Again the output moves at first but then it goes back and we get offset free tracking. If you look at the cost it's monotonic again whenever the set point and disturbance are constant and you can see that here. But of course in this particular case the optimized values for the perturbation variables C are no longer zero because here we're doing the SOMPC algorithm and that was discussed at length in the earlier videos. So the observations then, the cost is monotonic when the target and disturbance are constant, the responses are convergent, the perturbations are now non-zero as expected, but we do get offset free tracking. Finally, let's look at example three, which is a multivariable example. So if we go here to example three and run this one, and what you notice here is a bit messier because we've got lots of different signals going on. But again, you'll notice when there's a target change. So here I've got a target in just one loop and we track the target offset free tracking. Then we change the target in the second loop. And what do we notice? Offset free tracking, the blue lines tend to the red lines. Then we get a disturbance change. You'll see this green line changes. And once again, the outputs are coming back. We're getting offset free tracking. If you look at the cost, You'll see again this J is monotonic whenever the target and the disturbance are constant 
as expected. And if you look at the perturbation variable C, again you see they are non-zero, and this is the same sort of issue as discussed in the earlier videos. So there we go, cost monotonic, response is convergent, perturbation is not zero, and we have offset free tracking and disturbance rejection. So conclusions, extensions for OMPC and SOMPC and for tracking and disturbance rejection are straightforward using the same concepts of chapter one, that is we ensure the prediction index and the predictions are unbiased. The proposal here defines the algorithms with respect to deviation variables, deviations about the expected, and I should underline that, expected steady state, and the examples show that this works well. The steady state estimates must be updated every sample, because in practice the disturbance and the target may change. So basically, these are the equations that we're using. We define some deviation variables, which is the distance of the state and the input from the expected steady state. We define the control law and the predicted predictions using these deviation variables. And we define the performance index using these deviation variables. So as long as everything is done with respect to deviation variables, all the same results carry across as for the regulation case.